The Rocky Horror Picture Show is a movie we're not talking about today on Musical March in September. No, no. Instead, we'll be talking about the follow-up film from writer Richard O'Brien and director Jim Sharman, which, depending on what Rocky Horror fan you talk to, either pales in comparison to the 1975 original or is one of the most underrated films of all time. Where does my opinion lie on this almost forgotten 80s gasm? <laughs> well, I don't know. Am I actually gonna talk about the film or am I just gonna riff it? You need to be the Get to jumping like a real life wire. Need to be the shop treatment. So look out, mister. Don't you blow your last resistor for a pistol that'll mystify ya. You're blinded by romance, you're blinded by science Your condition is critically grave But don't expect mercy from such an alliance Suspicion of tradition, so you Originally titled The Brad and Janet Show, Shock Treatment is the continuing adventures of Brad and Janet Majors, played by Jessica Harper and Cliff DeYoung, who replace Susan Sarandon and Barry Bostwick, respectively. But other Rocky Horror alumni, such as O'Brien, Little Nell, Charles Gray, and Patricia Quinn show up playing different, or slightly different, characters. Attempting to mimic the Rocky Horror Picture Show's rise to cult film status, the film was given plenty of hype upon release, complete with a promotional tie-in film called The Rocky Horror Treatment, but it was only shown to audiences as a midnight movie on Halloween, never getting a wide release. That may have been a mistake. Reviews of the film were mixed to negative, but it has since received a critical reevaluation as a sort of profit of a film, which near correctly predicted the future of television, reality show celebrities, and audience dependence on human exploitation. That is, if you read into that sort of thing, which I do. Regardless of what people thought of the film then, and what fans think of it now, the movie probably should have been given a wider release than simply midnight showings. I'm just saying, it probably could have inched a little closer to making back its $3 million budget, and more than just these people would have gone to see it beyond a midnight release. Upon first glance, it's easy to feel a little worrisome, when the first moments of the Rocky Horror Picture Show were the iconic science fiction opening credit sequence, this movie has an opening made up of... Freeze Frame! Probably of Les Moonves' green lighting survivor, Acapulco. And I think Grandpa Simpson may be giving us the rambly backstory. Once upon a time, in a town not far from yours, there lived a real fast guy. His life was fast. His friends were fast. <laughs> Even his food was fast. His name was Slowpoke Rodriguez. But then we are thrust into what could be considered Chuck Woolery's vision of heaven. And what is already a more realistic version of SNL than Wired. At least Daryl Hammond's Sean Connery will probably make an appearance on one of these game shows. The film was originally scripted to take place all around the town of Denton. But because of a Screen Actors Guild strike, filming could not be done outdoors. And the script was rewritten to have the heart and soul of the town of Denton be located right in a television studio. How hooked are these citizens on TV? They wait outside like it's Black Friday and the studio is giving 50% off deals on some sweet Real Housewives merch. The land of TV is such a thriving business in Denton, it's like it has its own mini-town inside of the real town. And even an anthem to go along with it. You'll find happy hearts and smiling faces and tolerance for the ethnic races. Okay, so what's Steve Doocy doing here then? Crime must be low. The prison only takes up part of a giant letter. But I don't know about the police department. And Denton girls are... <whistles> full of beauty. They're 13 and you're a cop. And they might also be Tony Basil. You may call us the goody-goody two-shoes. We're here to cheer you with the good news. 
Normally, studios just have an applause card, but this studio audience has entire song lyrics they need to read from. This is either the best or worst karaoke bar ever. Ugh, just here to see an episode of Cheers, goddammit! Brad and Janet are seen in the audience, with Brad having such bad rhythm, he can't even clap his hands right. He seemed fine several years ago. Charles Gray plays Judge Wright, who seems to be the only honest person on DTV. Did you enjoy our anthem? In a way. Whoa, let's not be speaking the truth here. Quick, cut to a commercial break. Okay, kids, let's hear the five Fs for today. Um, excuse me, I will not tolerate kids saying the F word on my show. Kids getting slaughtered, though? Hmm, that's a different story. F for... Barley! F for... Flavor! Okay, so there were no fucks in there, but you should really do something about your swastika-like logo. We're introduced to a show called Marriage Maze, hosted by Bert Schnick, sort of a cross between Jose Feliciano and Tony Clifton. The show itself looks like one of the channels John Ritter and Pam Dauber didn't land on and stay tuned. Before we start, I want to say one or two words about tomorrow night's great new show, The Faith Factory Show. Don't patronize me, audience. Since Brad and Janet appear to be the only squares in the audience, odds are they're gonna be contestants. What an ideal couple they are. You know, more than anyone else in Denton, they represent the old values. Damn right they represent old values. Finally, I was able to wear my corset in public without the fear of strap rash. Once their name is called, I feel I should throw rice. Something about watching a Richard O'Brien film makes me want to interact with it. Now, introduce yourselves. My I'm name Janet Mayfield. Oh, sorry. Slut! Asshole! Ooh, sorry, I'm interacting with the wrong movie again. <laughs> You're supposed to shout that at the Oogie Loves. Since the events of Rocky Horror and their subsequent marriage, Brad and Janet have been having a rough go of things. Let's face it, Janet. Brad's an emotional cripple! <laughs> really? Brad's an emotional cripple? I can't imagine why. Did the remake of Endless Love have anything to do with it? And I think the opening song proves that they know how to say the word Denton. Denton, Denton, you got no pretension. And get the banker from Deal or No Deal out of there. I'll stick with good Howie Mandel game shows like... Um... It suggested that Brad go under psychiatric treatment for being a very boring husband, and also ratings! I am sick of being humiliated by you! Yeah, you're significantly nerdier than you were in 1975. But this is a musical, so sing about it. Dear Blender You won't blend into the background for this in your home. Won't you help a first defender or toaster? Popularity well, there's his problem. He keeps singing to household appliances. Look at this! Refrigerator Why are we always sooner or later? Bitching in the kitchen or crying in the bedroom all night. Why are we bitching in the kitchen and crying in the bedroom all night? Well, because you'd rather fuck the refrigerator, obviously. I'm not sure you should be singing about knives in a song about your bad marriage, but I like how he progressively gets more confused by the objects he has to sing about. Oh, trash can. You can't handle the trash can, can't Don't you put the dirt on me? Good save. You'd rather talk about trash than your wife. I see the host walks by to make sure Jessica Harper didn't get her singing skills from a coven of witches. Brad gets taken off to Dentonvale, a show based in a studio insane asylum where he's being committed, all while everyone must keep a happy face, because television. Don't worry, Paul Schaefer and Helena Bottom Carter will fix you right up. I made a Drop Dead Fred joke in the last episode, which thank God, because this time around, Rick Mayall is standing right there. I'm Dr. Cosmo McKinley. Yes, I know. The creepy trailer already told me. That's very good. Hello, I'm Dr. Cosmo McKinley. I'm glad this acid I just dropped comes with its own doctor. Trust me, I'm a doctor. I don't trust you, doctor. You stuck your fingers up my ass long before you told me you were medically qualified. I don't know what kind of show this is, but I am shocked that Dr. Drew's not hosting it. 
What the hell? Little Nell has long hair this time around? Now how is every pixie in the world supposed to dress up like her for Halloween? But like every good studio, both a contract and panties are drawn up with a sole purpose of exploiting a bad marriage with sex appeal. It's just like the newlywed game, if it were made today. Not only does Cliff de Young portray Brad, but also the villain, Farley Flavors, a fast food giant who has taken over numerous programs of DTV. He? How dare this person take advantage of my weakness? Which is why you're the perfect candidate for our DTV series on sanity. Don't worry, there's also cameras everywhere to take advantage of everyone's weaknesses. <laughs> and with the power of television, we can make you hate your husband. Even when she goes to talk things out with her mother, it's during a show titled Happy Homes, located entirely in the studio, along with product placement. And the disapproving upper-class father. Don't you want your daughter to look pretty? Who's she got to look pretty for? She's got a husband. She's got a weirdo. I've never seen him play golf in the kitchen once. Don't worry, the show totally pushes the envelope. And they found him at the back of Wilson's Bakery. Naked, with 15 other men. Mexicans. Yeah, we were all kind of riding that Archie Bunker high at the time. <laughs> Some shows forgot about a little thing called context. Your father doesn't like Mexicans. Your father doesn't like Mexicans. Yeah! Well then what the hell was with those opening lyrics in your town's anthem? And tolerance for the ethnic races. I'm blaming you, Steve Doocy. TV is lying to me. This dude is like Tim the Tool Man Taylor if he was just a complete tool. A man should call the toss. Wear the pants and be the boss. A man should be the drink for his own damn sake. And that's why God made boys. The song's pretty gay, bro. And I haven't even gotten to Can't Stop the Music yet. Thank God I have TV to tell me what a real man is. Faggots are maggots. Thank God I'm a man. See, back then we had shows to tell us directly what manliness was like. Nowadays, you have to find that kind of advice in a comment section. But Farley Flavors feels Janet's perfect girl-next-door quality makes her an excellent role model for his Sanity for Today campaign. And who wouldn't want to go along with this pitch? so I may be helping out a supervillain, yes, but I'll also become a famous model. All right, I'll do it. But lying to her helps. Quite frankly, he hates you. What do you mean? Brad is harboring deep feelings of hostility towards you, Janet. No, no, that's not manipulative enough. He wants to see your rating soar. He needs a woman of exceptional desirability. If this movie were any more ahead of its time, it'd feature an audience freaking out over a wardrobe malfunction. Janet moves into the DTV studio, and I'm just assuming that every room Jessica Harper sleeps in is lit like a Dario Argento film. And it wouldn't be a great reality show if it didn't have an incest twist with Dr. Cosmo and his sister, Dr. Nation. But you keep going back, it's driving you. Awkward. What's in the other window? It's time for mamas. It's been a great day. Thanks a heap. Uh, look, uh, don't sing like that. I'm starting to question you really being 18. They may not be able to feed their extras, but at least they gave them a place to crash. Unfortunately for the judge, the story that's being read to him has taken him on a strange journey to sleep. But let's all admit that the idea of Janet showering is enough to cure blindness. Up up. Nice to see you up and above. And it makes her deaf, apparently. If she's gonna be a reality star, she needs a bit more ego stroking. You're beautiful. The most desirable creature that ever walked. Yes, but you're not TV beautiful, so we need to fix that. Do you really think so? Everybody needs you. Hmm, I've seen creepier people in the fashion police. This is nothing. 
And while Rocky Horror may have taught me how to do the time warp, this one teaches me how to make a dress. Well, first you go rip, rip, rip. Then you go snip, snip, snip. Then you whip it and zip, zip, zip. I spit it up to the hip, hip, hip. Oddly enough, I think that's also the theme song to Botched. Only a lot catchier. Flip, flip, flip. And through that little black dress. Hitler. Wait, did she just say Hitler? Well, first you go rip, rip, rip. Then you go snip, snip, snip. Then you whip in a zip, zip, zip. Now she's perfectly dressed to con Steve Martin and Michael Caine. Rise and shine, studio audience. You all smell terrible, by the way. And every 15 minutes of fame story lets you get to know your subject first. Me, me, me. Me, me, me. <laughs> Narcissism. You take that right down the street to the E-Network, little missy. After watching The Apple last week, I take it this is also 1994? No, no, leave that shot in. It'll go perfect for the bloopers show, hosted by Dick Clark. But at least Janet knows this is all for Brad's sanity. How's Brad? Oh, well, if he caught my act, he'll be looking good. Honey, he's in a jail cell. The audience is totally into her, enough to even mention it to her parents. How about that? Janet was a knockout. Thank you. Yeah, she was terrific. Sexy! What? I didn't know you were going to objectify her. Was that in the contract? Huh. You're practically naked. Except for that dress that's covering you. But since this is television, you can be passive-aggressive. You just have to be sexy about it. Hi, Brad. I've just come to tell you how fabulous I am. <laughs> While drugs aren't working on Brad, clearly the movie's title song will work. I'm not a locum with no to suit you myself. I've been a cynic for too many years. Ugh, you and me both, brother. I miss being able to feel joy about things. But if you open your heart to a smooth operator, Ooh. he'll take you for all that you've got. And if he kills you, Nancy Grace will still make you a celebrity. But leave it to this movie to make me want to commit myself, just because it looks amazing. You're blinded by romance, you're blinded by science, your condition is critically grave. I'm gonna go on record and say that I'm cool with any song that's about being blinded with science. Over the years, writer Richard O'Brien would address the many flaws he has with the film, calling the plot confusing and his performance horrible, but he does still praise the music and the film's prediction of reality television. But I disagree about O'Brien's acting. I can't take my eyes off O'Brien's performance, and it's not because it's bad. You need to be the shot to jump in like a real life wire Need a bit of Ooh, sharp treatment So look out, mister Don't you blow your left resistor For a sister that'll certify ya Fire, fire He's creepily wonderful in this film And he seems as perfectly qualified To administer shock treatment As Peter Lorre would be I'd be happy if I were in the audience, too. That was also my favorite song in the movie. Oh, do I get one of those? Uh, why, yes. Everyone should have their own giant photo of Cliff de Young. Wait a minute, he's still not really blind? And he's Dame Edna. Wait, that is Dame Edna. Sure hope this fame doesn't get to her. Don't forget who we're doing this for. Who? Brad. You know, I'm getting awfully sick of hearing about that Emotional cripple. My ears are burning. Oh, wait, did, did she say Brad? Sorry, I thought she said Craig or Vincent. Like every reality star, only about six people truly like them. They're just really loud, young, and stupid. But not every reality star has Charles Gray trying to save them. Yes, Barry. Well, the false promise of a new dawn usually leads to a most bloody sunset. At least I think he was trying to save them. Sounded more like he was threatening James Bond again. And this is the early 80s, so the more drugs, the better. Have another sedative. You can always trust someone who looks like a cross between Robert Evans, Ward Cleaver, and Popeye. I've always been under the impression that every TV studio in the 80s looked like this, and that most of their budgets went towards quarters for the studio arcade. 
Plus, it was nice of Abel Ferrara to show up to direct a musical version of Fear City. Move along now, Deborah Harry has to sing about the rapture soon. While that may have all been a dream, it was at least a beautifully shot dream. Do you have any friends? Sure. You won't have soon. Well, no, not when you enter a room like this. I've just come to tell you how fabulous I am. Meow, 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 meow. How fabulous are they? Andy Cohen has been trying to get a hold of them for hours. I see the judge is going undercover. Oh no, that's not what real doctors look like. Here are the real doctors. <laughs> I trust them operating on me. Clearly, this is taking place during the BIM hour, which is why no one is tending to my stab wound. Meanwhile, fellow TV host Betty Hapshat has made a startling discovery about the doctors. Oh my god. Character actors. No, that's good news for you. It means they could die like halfway through the film. What's this? Twins? According to this picture, John Provost and Jay North are the same person! I knew it! The judge figures out that Farley Flavors and Brad are both twin brothers, with Farley wanting to punish Brad out of jealousy. Brad had a decent enough life growing up, while Farley grew up poor and becoming slightly evil. And she represents everything our customers want. Innocence. Decency. Tits. Ass. I still can't find Farley too evil. His teeth are amazingly bright. Could you tell us a little more about it? Well, let's just say we're planning on putting sanity back on the national menu. You're canceling Red Eye? Drugged up on live TV juice, Janet is declared Miss Mental Health. Now, if she looks zoned out, it's okay. The side effects were perfectly stated. Allergic reactions such as shortness of breath or swelling of your tongue or throat may occur and may be fatal. See? She'll get the 20 hours of sleep a night that she needs. Plus an extra prize for the mentally abled. Brand new! Ultra Deluxe 8-cylinder convertible! What the hell they need a car for? No one ever leaves the studio. Though I know he's evil, he has charisma. And charisma can make me continue to watch horrible people on television. My friends, tonight we are taking the first step of defiance and starting something that will grow so big that the whole world will reverberate with its sound. Oh, shut up and take my money before I quote more Futurama! Admittedly, the first time I saw this, the twist about them being twins was a shock, as it took embarrassingly long for teenage me to figure out they were both played by Cliff DeYoung. I feel like I've seen this twin story done recently, and with a lot of music in it, too. Fuck that! Unless you read the questionably glowing reviews for the identical on IMDb, that'll happen when the producer deliberately tells people to do that. Needless to say, this is the better, more talented twin film. Hell, Cliff even has a duet with himself! We lost our home, our family. You've lost compassion, now you're losing me. Well, the best thing you could ever do is die. Shut up and take my money! Wait, wait, no, no, I don't want that. I don't even want to know what this next lyric is about. You lost your baby when you lost your balls! Well, then why did you let this man operate on you? This could be worse than the old series. In the old series, we never had a convertible. You shouldn't be shocked when you wake up with your balls missing. But when Brad does grow his pair back and reclaims his love for Janet and vice versa, that's too happy of an ending. So they're led away by gunpoint, since Brad and Janet's feelings are no match for evil Farley flavors and a gullible audience who are dying to try the new line of fashion. Asylum chic, that's right, evil wins at the end. He is going to take over the entire human race who are willingly lining up for shock treatment which is still an incredibly catchy song, so I understand. Things are happy for Brad and Janet, too. Our heroes finally have an entire TV studio at their disposal. We are gonna do it anyhow, anyhow. We are gonna do it anyhow, anyhow. We're gonna do it. 
guess, but will there be coming involved? I won't know the sex is good unless you're singing about ejaculation. They all drive away in their brand newish car, but don't go too far. We can't get sued by the Screen Actors Guild. I'm so conflicted here. Clearly, the movie has a level of satire and wit that's perfectly applicable to today's audience, but it also only has a 40% on Rotten Tomatoes. I'm gonna need to bring in another opinion here. Will shock treatment follow in Rocky Horror's footsteps and play for years at midnight? Well, I don't think so, for a couple of reasons. One, because the Rocky Horror audience is fanatically loyal. They're not about to abandon a movie they spent the last three years of their lives in memorizing. Yes, thank you. I know that when I love a movie to the point to where I could quote it from beginning to end, I never ever love any other movie ever, let alone memorize another movie's lines. What do I look like to you? Some kind of movie whore? I am not going to cheat on a movie that I love by watching another movie that I love. You're going to have to memorize two scripts here. While well, Shock Treatment may have been specifically designed to have similar cult movie appeal as Rocky Horror, it did gain an audience over time, it just took it several years longer than Rocky Horror did. Not necessarily because all audience members in 1981 thought it was bad, but with such a minimal release, many people hadn't even heard of the film until its VHS release. The film has now gone through special edition DVD treatments, as well as more midnight releases, fan sites, and internet series reviewing the film. And between this and moment by moment, this is the far better film to end with a series of Polaroids. While Cliff Young may be a little too Arnold Poindexter-y in some scenes, he perfectly nails the sinister smarminess of Farley flavors, and while Susan Sarandon's Janet may have represented a more naive and innocent Janet, Jessica Harper perfectly captures the I'm a bored housewife and have been married to a schlub for several years vibe. You can even see it just by her facial expressions. Tell me, spectator, why are we all sooner or later? Bitching in the kitchen or crying in the bedroom all night. She also has a lot of fun with her character arc, especially when Janet transitions into fake TV celebrity. There are regulations about this sort of thing. It's for his own good. Well, I've got one movie left in Musical March in September. Will it be something that falls in the is it really that bad category, or will it be something terrible? Does this bird belong to you? 